Today we're going to talk about partial derivatives to start out with. <coughs> so then, so then, uh, this is section 13.3. partial derivatives. So the best way to start this out probably is with looking at an example. f of x and y is equal to say uh, 4x squared plus 5x uh, y cubed. Okay so here's a function. And now this function is a function of how many variables? Two variables. So then now in the calculus one context, it doesn't really make sense to say the derivative currently. Right? Because in the calculus one sense, would you mean differentiation with respect to x or with respect to y or maybe even something else altogether? <coughs> right? So then you might wonder, what are we going to do? So the way we're going to proceed is we're going to define two different derivatives of this function. Two different derivatives. Okay, one of them for x and one of them for y. Okay, now that's the reason for calling these, this derivative a partial derivative because this function has several uh, variables. We can differentiate with respect to each variable and each one of them gives us some information concerning the derivative. Right, and, and the derivative, as in the, the definite article the, uh, is not complete without information from all partial derivatives. Okay, so does everybody sort of understand the idea? Where now we have to relax the notion of calculus one of the derivative. Okay, so then we'll come back to this and we'll make a remark. So this is the partial derivative. Okay, so then given a function f of x and y, the partial derivative with respect to x is defined as the following. So it is denoted, so then now, what is the, the notation we would use from here if this was calculus one? You would say f, f what? f prime, right? You'd say f prime. But that prime, even in calculus one, we were starting to run into some <laughs> issues. We were running into the issue that, uh, well, in some cases, uh, prime, the prime notation means derivative with respect to x. In still other cases, the prime notation means der derivative with respect to t. Right, so then here, the prime notation would be unacceptable because you, you can't, it's, it doesn't clearly specify what derivative we're talking about. So the partial derivative with respect to x is denoted f sub x, f sub x at x and y, <coughs> and is defined as the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h y minus f of x y over h. So this looks just like the definition of derivative for calculus one. Right? It's sort of like I'm taking the calculus one derivative definition and just ignoring y, like we're ignoring it. Okay, so then given f of x, the partial derivative with respect to x is defined as this, and of course the caveat is whenever this limit exists. If the limit doesn't exist, then the partial derivative is not defined. So then give me an example of a calculus one situation where a function does not have a derivative at a point. So what's an example? Anyone have one? Absolute value, right? Absolute value doesn't have a derivative at the origin. Right? It doesn't have a derivative there because it's pointy there. So now imagine if I took the absolute value function, okay, so that we're sort of looking at it like so, 
and then now I say that, okay, well, I'll turn it and now sweep it that way, right? So that it's like a V, a v trough, right? like this. So it's like a plane going down and a plane going up, meeting, right, at a point along the low point so that you might, you know, be able to pour water in there. And from the side, if you were to look at, if you were to look at this from the side, you know, it would look like this and that there's some water in here. You know. And I could draw sort of a perspective view of it. <coughs> so, like this. Okay, so does everyone sort of see the structure I'm talking about? Okay, so now, this derivative, right, this derivative, the derivative of this surface doesn't exist at the trough, right, at that, at that place where the trough is pointy. But the thing is, is that how about, what if you were going uh, right along this line right here, and you were following the red line along the trough like so, right, you were going that way. Okay, then would you be going up or down? Neither, neither one, right? You wouldn't be going up, you wouldn't be going down. So then that particular trajectory, what would be, in a sense, the derivative of that tra trajectory? The derivative would be zero. zero. Ah, so then the derivative of this surface exists in the red direction that I've indicated here. It exists, and the derivative is zero. It's not changing in that direction. Whereas if you instead uh, attempt to compute a derivative in another direction like this, then that would be like computing the derivative along this direction. And you can see that from the left side, the derivative would be negative, and from the right side, the derivative would be positive. And at the corner there, the derivative simply doesn't exist. So does everybody sort of understand the idea? So here I'm talking about a surface where the derivative exists in one direction, right? A partial derivative exists in one direction, but not in the other. Okay. <coughs> so let's do an example of computing the derivative so for uh, with the definition so let's take this one so for example so we'll take that function and the instruction is to compute compute f sub x of x and y by definition by the definition. Okay, so then according to the definition, this is what it will be. So, first off, I will need f of x plus h, uh, comma y. So then let's compute that. So then that will be 4 <coughs> x plus h squared plus 5 y cubed. Okay, so then after, after multiplying this out, maybe 4 x squared plus 8xh plus 4h squared plus 5y cubed. Okay, so this is just, some, this should be not a significant surprise to you. Okay, so then the next thing I need is f of x plus h, f of x plus h, y minus f of x and y. Right, so then what will remain after I perform that subtraction? Yep, 8xh plus 4h squared, good. <coughs> okay, so then, by the definition now that I've performed this, these intermediate algebraic steps, f sub x of x and y should be the limit as h goes to 0 of 8xh plus 4h squared over h. So then now, can you plug in the limit point h is equal to 0 currently? No, you cannot because it would be indeterminate, but you should expect that because the derivative itself is indeterminate, right, without further algebraic consideration. So then, now, because, h, because we're inside of the limit and because that guarantees that h is non-zero, that means I can factor an h out of the numerator, cancel it with the one in the denominator, and say that this is the limit as h goes to 0 of 8x plus 4h. 
Okay, now how about this expression? Can you compute? Can you compute the limit of this one? So what is the limit? 8x, right? So then let me make a mistake here. How about 4h? Is it 4h? Well, I plugged in 0. Ah, right. What is the what is the limiting symbol? It's h, not x. Right? So then so it's 8x. So I just bring that up because that's one common mistake I see frequently. Okay, so then what we're saying what we're saying is that the partial is 8x. The x partial is 8x. So now I have a question for you. Now if we scroll back up to the top and look at this function here that I'm boxing in red. So now I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little bit surprising to you. x and y are independent variables. Right? x and y, they don't depend on each other. So then, what in this context, wh y is a constant with respect to x. So with that in your brain, have a look at the expression 4x squared plus 5y cubed and tell me, what would the derivative be with respect to x of that expression, assuming y is a constant? 8x, right? 8x plus 0, 8x plus 0 because 5y cubed is a constant. Okay, so does everyone understand this, this question? So then now, similarly, right, similarly, and I'll say without a computation, what do you suppose f sub y of x and y will be? What do you suppose it will be? 15y squared. Right, 15y squared. <coughs> because now you're treating x as a constant and y is the derivative. Uh, y is the variable and we're computing the derivative with respect to y. Okay, so any question concerning this example? Yes? Independent, yes. Yeah, so you could think of it, you know, here's a function, and you could say that we can consider the corresponding surface z is equal to 4x squared plus 5y cubed. So what that would be telling you is that over the xy plane, on top of the xy plane, you're assigning a height. For each xy, you're assigning it height 4x squared plus 5y cubed. So it would be like some kind of surface you could run your hand over like so. Okay? <coughs> so other questions concerning this example. Okay, so then let's quickly uh, run ourselves through the ringer on these. So what if I give you a function f of x and y is equal to, how about x squared cosine of 5x minus 7y. So please compute the x partial, f sub x, of x and y. This is not, not using the limit definition. Not that way. <coughs> yeah, so then, so, right, we're going to need to use, how, how, what rule do you think will be necessary to compute the derivative of this product of functions of x? Probably the product rule, right? So then, so then, the product rule, right, x squared, sub x times cosine of 5x minus 7y plus x squared times cosine of 5x minus 7y sub x. So then now, tell me, what does this mean, this notation sub x? <coughs> it's just like the prime. And it's just like the prime. It's, it's surrogate notation for the prime. But notice notice here that if I was to temporarily just write prime here, what would be the problem with using this kind of notation? Right, you don't know if, if this is signifying differentiation with respect to x or y, so then such notation is illegal now in this context. Okay, so sub x. Okay, so then now, right, 2x 
cosine of 5x minus 7y plus x squared. Now, the derivative of cosine is negative sine of 5x minus 7y. And then now, for the, now another rule is coming up. What rule? The chain rule, right? So now multiplied by 5x minus 7y x partial. If you can do it all in your head, I don't care. It's fine. But I'm just illustrating all of the finer points here. <coughs> so then 2x cosine 5x minus 7y minus x squared sine of 5x minus 7y multiplied by 5. Okay, so any question concerning this example? Okay, so the purpose of this example is to illustrate to you that we are doing something that is slightly different, but it is substantially, currently substantially the same as what you were doing before, right? This is the same product rule and the same chain rule that you're accustomed to. The only thing that is different is that now y represents a variable which is independent of x. Okay, so any question concerning this? So then now, please do this, f sub y of x and y. f sub y for the same function. So what do you think about this x squared? Constant. It's a constant, right? So it's just like having a 5 hanging out there or a 10 or whatever. So then, so then the derivative, right? I'll do it in several steps just to illustrate the finer points. Right? 5x minus 7y sub y. Well, that's equal to I can factor the x squared out because it's a constant with respect to y. 5x minus 7y sub y. So that factorization of x squared out, that's the constant multiple rule from calculus 1 that you already knew. Okay, so then now this is equal to this is equal to x squared. The derivative of cosine is negative sine 5x minus 7y. And then now for the chain rule, multiply by the partial of 5x minus 7y, specifically the y partial. Okay, so then now this is, uh, I'll factor the negative out, so negative x squared sine of 5x minus 7y multiplied by negative 7. Right, so any question concerning this example? Okay, so product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, they all apply. Okay, so any questions concerning this? Okay, so I have a question for you. How about how about uh, how about this right here? This expression that I'm circling in our boxing in red. Do you see a common factor in it? X, right? So then I could rewrite that expression one more time and factor out an X. So then if I was to plug in X is zero into the X partial, can you see that it would be zero? Yeah. What would that mean geometrically? It means, it, it means that you're not changing in the x direction. Right? You're not changing in the x direction. Okay, uh, another thing. How about the y partial? If I was to plug in x is 0, you would get 0. zero. So that means it's also not changing in the y direction. So if it's not changing in the x direction, and it is also not changing in the y direction, what that means is that the tangent plane there is horizontal. The tangent plane is horizontal. So then now, let me ask you. I'm standing on a surface, a plane, so we all pretty much agree it's horizontal, <laughs> up to a very good approximation, right? Horizontal. So then let's say, let's say that now I'm in this situation, that if I move left and right, I'm not going up and down. Okay, that's the only information that you have. I'm standing on a surface, and as I move left and right, I'm not going up and down. Am I standing on a horizontal surface? 
Not necessarily. So then if not necessarily, <coughs> then then what? I might be on a mountain, right? Or maybe maybe we just took, you know, we took the floor and tilted it uh, 20 degrees in this direction, right? So then as I move side to side, I'm still not going up and down. And I'm not going up and down at all. But I could start going up and down if instead I move in what direction? Forward and backwards, right? So then that would be taking me up and down. So does everybody see that now what the derivative is measuring, it's measuring your change in a certain direction. It's measuring a change in a certain direction. It is perfectly <coughs> legitimate to have zero change in one direction and non-zero change in another direction. Okay, so any questions concerning that? <coughs> okay, good. So then now we've got... So now you can see that in this context it does not make sense. It does not make sense to say the derivative. And in calculus one, that was acceptable, right? Because in all those cases, we had functions of one variable, or we were somehow able to transform the situation into a function of one variable. So it was a perfectly legitimate thing to say the derivative because it was not ambiguous. Okay, but here, you cannot say the derivative, and so the, the terminolo terminology is partial, right? A partial derivative. Okay, good. So then now we need to have a bit of notation. Okay, so then in calculus one, in calculus one, this was the situation. We could have a function y is f of x. And in calculus two, in calculus two, now we have functions like z is uh, f of x and y. Okay, so I'm setting up two columns so that we can compare the notation piece for piece. So in calculus one, in calculus one, this was a very common occurrence to say the right hand side is f prime. Okay, so the right hand side is f prime. So then this notation is due to really the this is a sort of a combination of notations of two different people, Euler and Newton. Right? Newton actually used dots, right? He used something that looks like this. So for those of you that have taken physics class, you might have seen that before. Okay, so other people moved it, you know, kind of over here like this, so it looks like this. Now, what do you write on the left-hand side? dy dx, right? And this dy dx is another notation due to another uh, very gifted person that has since died <laughs> named Leibniz. Okay, so then very useful notation, dy dx. It's very useful because it is very connected to the geometry of what's happening. Okay. So we want to have, we want to export this notation and also the cor and the underlying geometries over to the other side. Okay, so then now, let's say that we are computing partial with respect to x, then the notation is f sub x. Okay, now we need a new notation for the left-hand side. Okay, and it is going to look similar, similar, it's going to look like dy dx, and even still, it's pronounced dy dx, but it is written differently. Okay, so then it is written like so. Uh, d, z, d, x. Okay, so just so you can see it, let's zoom in. Right, it looks like that. So it's like a fancy script d. Right, it's not, it looks like so. Okay, not this one. So yes, this one. Not this one. The difference is, so let me write, that looks too much like an X. Let's make it red. <coughs> so the difference is that this notation, this sort of fancy notation, this indicates to the reader and the grader, just more importantly for you, that you understand that I'm computing a derivative but it is not the derivative, right? It does not contain all of the derivative information. It contains some of the derivative information. When you, when you use this Latin D, right, the D that you've used in previous contexts, that is indicating to the reader and to the grader that in your opinion, 
this derivative represents all of the derivative information there is to have. Okay, so then if I give you a function and I say compute some partial derivatives and you say dz dx and you use this d, what you are telling the grader is that you think that this is it. Right? So do you see the difference? Right? So for this reason, one interesting thing, right? This symbol right here, you should go look at the math department and other math departments and see how many uh, of, the, of the people wearing tennis shoes are wearing ASICs, right? So is anyone wearing ASICs? <laughs> it's pretty interesting because that's, that's the same symbol that's on ASICs shoes. In fact, I wore ASICs for a very long time for that reason only, but ASICs, <laughs> ASICs as a company decided that all of their tennis shoes are going to be just flamboyantly colored, and I'm just, I don't know, I just can't abide that. <laughs> so, so now I'm wearing Nikes. So if they ever, you know, maybe if ASICs ever listens to this, you know, they ought to have like a, a gray or white tennis shoe for mathematicians. They do? Yeah. E well, y you're lucky. I looked for a week for some reasonably colored ASICs. Okay. <coughs> so then now, we, s we have an issue here because these two lines are in correspondence. Right? These two lines are in correspondence. But these two lines, unfortunately, not entirely in correspondence because this one this one represents a notion of the derivative and this one represents a notion of partial derivative some of the derivative so this is the first derivative and this is a first partial so then in order to make the correspondence complete i need to include another first partial what other first partial yes dz dy like so. So then f sub y, x and y. Okay? <coughs> so any question about this? Any question about this? Yeah, so it's a good question. So then now, now, in calculus one, we also had this, and, and let me know if this is what you were speaking of. dy is f prime of x dx. So the analogy to this one, right? Kind of, right? So then now, what goes right here is the question. And the answer is that we're going to address this in about 20 minutes. Okay? <coughs> for, now, for now, it's not time to address it yet. Okay, but we're getting there. Okay, so then this, right, this is called the differential. And you should remember that from Calculus 1 where we said, okay, I want you to approximate the square root of whatever to four decimal places or whatever, blah, 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 using a linear approximation. So you use differentials in that case. Okay, and we're going to, we're going to address this, but not yet. <coughs> okay, so then now... Now we have a more, a slightly more pressing matter, and that is, okay, all right. What about this? What would this notation mean in Calculus 1? Right, the second derivative, which is nice. Right, the second derivative, okay? So then that's how it's denoted with the prime notation. With the D notation, how's it uh, denoted? d squared y over dx squared. Okay, d squared y over dx squared. Okay, the reason for this notation, the reason for that notation is that this is d dx d dx y. Right, you take the you take y, compute its x derivative, and compute the x derivative of that. And if you were to treat these like fractions then it would be dx squared and d squared. Okay, so does everybody remember this? <coughs> okay, so now, now we've got a really serious issue, and that is this. Uh, how many first partials are there in this context? Two. So now what would it mean, what would it mean to compute a second partial? A first partial of a first partial. Right, so then now, when you want to compute a first partial, you have two options, right, with respect to the one variable or the other. 
So let's say you have a first partial now, and you want to compute a second partial. You have two options, either with respect to the first, par first partial or the second partial. So in this context, how many second partials are there? Four, right? There are four of them. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Okay, so then one place where I've already sort of introduced you to this notion is, remember, mm, I, s I was giving you this horse thing. I said a horse, pretend there's a horse right here. And I said, well, along the spine, the horse is concave up. And along the ribs, the horse is concave down. Right, so then what that means is that the concavity, right, the, the measurement of second derivative information c is significantly more involved and complicated than in the calculus one context. And so that you can see just by imagining a horse in your mind's eye. Now, algebraically, computationally, this is where it's coming up, right? The fact that there are going to be four partials, second partials. So, <coughs> so let's list them out. So one of the partials is fxx. Right, so that means compute the first partial with respect to x, and then compute the first, first partial with respect to x of that one. Right, so x partial followed by x partial. So it is denoted like so, d squared z dx squared. So that's not not too big of a deal, right? Sort of the analogy is currently working really good. Okay, so another one, the right-hand side, I will denote as yy. Okay, so that means compute the y partial and then follow that up by another y partial. So then in this case it means d squared z dy squared. Okay, and even that one is emotionally acceptable, <laughs> right? Okay, so now here's where it starts getting uh, a little bit hairy. So then now, f, x, y, x, y. So what does this mean, x, y, f, x, y? That's right, it means you compute partial with respect to x and then follow it with partial with respect to y. So then it's first x and then y. Okay. So then in this case, the notation is d squared z. And now dy dx. Okay, so then now tell me about the relationship between x's and y's on either side of this equation. They're in the, the opposite order, right? They're in the opposite order. So then, in this notation, right, this means x first, then y. And in this notation here, it still means x first and then y, but they're, they are in left to right, the opposite order. Okay? So then now, what is the last partial, sec the last second partial? Why is it written this way? So then the reason it is written this way is because... This is, so I'm telling you by definition, x, y means first x and then y, okay? So then, that means that y has to come last. Okay, so then, like so. So first x, then y. For those of you that are programmers and computer scientists, this has to do with a parsing thing, which has, you know, has to do with well, do you parse left or parse right? Do you do you do you recurse left or do you recurse right? So then, it's just there's two different notations for historically, basically insignificant reasons, okay? But nevertheless, they are computationally significant. Okay, so then now, what is the last partial? Second partial? F Y X. Right, x, y. And so in this case, this means which one comes first? First y, then x. Okay, so then now, uh, please write the proper notation with this one, with the d squared blah blah thingy. So d squared z and then 
dx dy. Okay? So that's lovely, isn't it? The second derivative from calculus, 1, now has become, in a sense, four different uh, second partials in calculus 2. So then we're eventually, by analogy to what we did in calculus 1, we're going to um, have a notion of, well, how do you measure if a function is concave up or whatever? Because if I give you a, a satellite dish, like a parabolic surface, and it's concave up in every direction, then we're still going to call that concave up because you could, you know, you could pour water in it and the water would stay. So it's still going to be concave up. I could take the same dish and pour it over and turn it over and then it would hold no water whatsoever. So such a surface is still going to be concave down. Okay, and then I could take a saddle. I could take a saddle and it's still going to have that, you know, strange feature where it's concave up in one direction and concave down in another direction. So in order to classify those various surfaces you will need all four second partials. You'll need all four of them. Wonderful. Okay, so any question about where we are and sort of what's going on? Okay. No, so then that's cutting, that's cutting in one direction. So now if I take the exact same saddle, you, you choose the xy coordinates. So you choose some direction and some other direction, and you're talking about an aligned, an aligned saddle. So now if I turn it like so, then it, it's constant. It can be constant in the x direction and in the y direction, so it's not going up or down in the x or y direction. But if you go along the axis y is equal to x or y is equal to negative x, then now it is concave up and down. So the problem is, is that the second partial is measuring how a first partial is changing. How a first partial is changing. So then, fxy is measuring the, in a sense, the concavity in the y direction of the x partial. Okay, the fxx is measuring the concavity in the x direction of the x partial. Okay, so it has to do with which measurement you're taking, which directions. <coughs> okay, so then ask me more after, after class, if you wish more clarification. Okay, so four partials, four second partials, but I have good news. I have good news for you. <coughs> and that is, let me make sure I have the condition. <coughs> the good news is that actually in almost all cases that you will be faced with, there are not four partials. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? So let's do an example. Okay, so an example. How about I give you f of x and y is x squared y cubed plus the cosine of 5x plus 4y. Okay, so then now, I'm going to very quickly compute the first partials. So how many first partials are there? Two. Two, good. So then, first partial is, so 2x y cubed minus cosine of 5x plus 4y times 5. Right, that's the x partial. Uh, somehow, it should be sine. I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay, so then now, good. The y partial, the y partial is 3x squared y squared minus sine of 5x plus 4y multiplied by 4. Okay, so those are the first partials. <coughs> now let's compute mm, all four uh, second partials, so xx. So then, what does that mean I should do? as far as computation is concerned. So I need to compute a derivative, but a derivative of what? I now have three things written on the page. This one, right? I use this one. Okay, so I'll use that one and compute the x partial of that. Okay, so then this will be 2y cubed uh, minus the cosine of 5x plus 4 y times 5 and then times 5 again. 
Right? One of those fives is from that line, and the second one of those fives is, is from the chain rule. Okay, so then the yy partial, okay, in this case it will be what? 6x squared y minus the cosine of 5x plus 4y multiplied by 4 multiplied by 4. Okay, now here's where things get slightly interesting. So if I do fxy, so what does this mean? Correct, right? I'm using that one. I'm using the x partial. Take the x partial and then compute the y partial of that. Okay, in this case, 6xy squared minus the cosine of 5x plus 4y multiplied by 5 multiplied by what? 4 for the chain rule. Okay, so that's fxy. Okay, now how about fyx? That means that I take the y partial, the y partial, and I compute the x partial of it. <coughs> okay, so if I do that, then 6xy squared minus the cosine of 5x plus 4y multiplied by 5, uh, 4y, right? Multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5. Okay, now tell me about the these two lines right here. They're the same, right? They're the same. Okay, so then one of them is xy and the other one is yx. So what do you suppose happened here? Did I accidentally choose a question where I made these two things the same and that this doesn't generally happen? No, it generally does happen, right, in this class, in this class. Okay, so then generally speaking, generally speaking, the, the unmixed, so let's make a, a statement here, and that is this. These two partials are said to be unmixed. Okay, so wh what is the meaning of this, right? This isn't some kind of uh, political statement, right? What does unmixed mean here? <coughs> yeah, it means this is partials only with X or partials only with Y. Okay, so then if these are called unmixed, then these are called what? Mixed. They're mixed because some x's, some y's, right? So generally speaking, you could have a function of 25 variables. You know, you could have the, you could have the x, y, a, b, r, x partial, right? And that would be mixed. That would be mixed. Okay, so then mixed and unmixed. So generally speaking, the comment that I'm going to make here is this. So, first, in 2419, the mixed second partials are almost always equal. So, what you should take away from this first comment is the following. If I ask you to compute all, all four second partials, okay, then you need to compute them all, right? You need to compute the x partial of the y partial and the y partial of the x partial. You must do them both. Now, let's say you do them both and you determine that the xy partial is different than the yx partial. Then what has probably happened? You have probably made a mistake. Right? You probably made an error and you should check it. You should go back and check. So then the exact, the exact statement <coughs> of, when this is, of when this is true is as follows. If fxy and fyx are continuous on an open disk containing x0, y0, then fxy of x0, y0 is equal to fy, uh, fyx of x0, y0. 
And basically, you can think of it like this. You compute the second partials as functions. If they are smooth enough, right? If, if the function is smooth enough, then its second partials will be continuous. And if they're continuous and a whole disk surrounding the point of interest, then the second partials are equal there. Okay, so then now, the truth of the matter is, is that I'm probably going to give you a take-home quiz question where the second partials are not equal. Okay, they're not equal. So then you can determine immediately what must be true about the second partials. They're not continuous. Right? So I, I can get, I'm going to give you a function where the second partials are not equal at a certain point. Okay, and the conclusion that you must draw from that is that, oh, well, I can compute the second partials, but they're not continuous at a point. Okay, so then the second partials are not equal at that point. And so mostly what, that's, what that particular surface is going to turn out to be, it's going to be a very fancy, fanciful form of a saddle. Right, a saddle that is so, so drastic right, that it causes, the de depending on which direction you're measuring, the concavity drastically changes sign depending on the, on the direction you're measuring. Okay, instead of smoothly changes sign. Right? It's okay to sit on a horse's saddle. Right? That's okay. It would be acceptable to sit on that kind of thing. Right? Humans, humans agree to that. But saddles can be made where you wouldn't want to sit on them right? if the concavity changes in a non-smooth way. Okay, good. So any question about this? Okay, so now we need to address we need to address the problem uh, that was mentioned previously of differentials. Right? And this basically is the most important thing uh, about, well, okay. I would say conceptually, geometrically, this is the most important concept we're going to do concerning these functions. Computationally, there is one other that is just as important and that is optimization problems, especially something called Lagrange multipliers. But that's coming, it's not today. Okay, so then this thing that we're about to do is the most important geometric thing. Okay, so now we're in section 13.4. Yes? So, I could ask you to compute the par a partial derivative of functions of arbitrarily many variables, right? So then, just to give you an example, right, I could say, you know, f of x, y, z, and w is equal to 4x plus 3y minus 2z plus 7w. Right, so then you should be able to tell me without hesitation, f sub w is what? It's 7. Okay, similarly. Now, as far as, as far as the other, like, really significant details that we're going to get into in this class, it will be constrained to functions of two variables. Other questions? <coughs> okay. Good. So, section 13.4. Section 13.4, and it is called differentials. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, <coughs> I'm going to tell you a definition a definition of differentiability for for calculus one, but it's not the definition that you're accustomed to, right? The definition that you're accustomed to says that okay, uh, if I give you a function just in an abstract way that's defined at a point, then we can define the limit. Uh, as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And then we made attempts to make this related to the limit of secant lines. And then we said, well, if we hold one of the points fixed and then we push the second point to the first point, then in the limit, this thing is no longer a secant line. It's a tangent line. It's a tangent line. And then we're, what we're going to do is say that the result of the limit computation is the slope of that tangent line. So does everybody remember that general argument? Somewhat. <laughs> it's ringing some bells, yes? Partial derivatives? Sure. Right? Shouldn't be any problem, right? So then, generally speaking, I'm not going to ask you to do something crazy, right? Probably something like a polynomial. 
Now, you should be able to compute the derivative, the partial, the derivatives of polynomials in calculus one and the derivatives of polynomials in calculus two. So a polynomial in calculus two is just, you take a, any polynomial in x and any polynomial in y and any, pol and any of their cross terms like xy or xy squared or whatever and you should be able to compute the derivative of such things using the definition. It works just like it does in Calculus 1. So if you remember in Calculus 1, when you're computing the derivative of a polynomial in Calculus 1, you always get to this point where all of the terms in the numerator cancel except those terms which have an h, and then you cancel them, blah, blah. So, so don't be too concerned. <coughs> but know that it's probably going to happen. Okay. So then from Calculus 1, From calculus one, I want you to consider the following. So let's say we are given a function f of x. We're given a function f of x. And another x equal to c in the domain of f of x. Right, so we're not interested in points that are away from the domain. We're only interested in points that are close to the domain, <coughs> or in the domain. So then, if, if, mm, if, what am I trying to say? We take, we are given a delta x. If we're given a delta x, then I'm going to say that delta y, delta y is f of x plus delta x minus f of x. Right, so what that's saying is that for some reason, some oracle, some external party has chosen delta x. And what we're defining delta y to be how much the function changes vertically uh, over that span from x to x plus delta x. <coughs> okay, so from x to x plus delta x. <coughs> then... Then, so if we're given this, then if, if you can write delta y is equal to, is equal to, what am I trying to say? <coughs> the derivative of f of x multiplied by delta x. The derivative of f of x multiplied by delta x plus some term epsilon multiplied by delta x. <coughs> okay, and epsilon goes to zero as delta x goes to zero. Then <coughs> f is differentiable at x. then f is differentiable at x. <coughs> okay, so now let's try and consider what this, what this might mean. Okay, so then <coughs> what this is saying is that the change in y, the change in y should be some constant multiple, right? So this Right, this is for a fixed value of x, so that's just a constant. The change in y should be a constant multiple of the change in x plus some other piece, which is not constant. But that piece, as delta x gets small, also gets small. Okay, so what this is saying is that, what this is saying is exactly what you are uh, hoping it says, what you remember it says from calculus one. What it's saying is that if I was to draw a function, like so, and select a point, like so, then I could draw the tangent line, and what the above algebraic definition is saying, it's saying that if you zoom in close enough, where'd it go? If you zoom in close enough, then the blue line, the blue curve, 
looks just like a line. Right? It looks just like a line. So that is to say that here I could select some value of delta x. Right? So here's delta x. This, this value right here is delta y. delta y. And this value right here, <coughs> I need another color, mm, red. This value right here, the vertical height, that one, that is the derivative evaluated at x multiplied by delta x. So what we're saying is that this little piece right here, this little piece right here, which is the error, the error in approximation between the tangent line and the actual graph. Right, that piece gets as small as we want. Right, this part is <coughs> epsilon multiplied by delta x. So then what we're saying is that, okay, you know, there's where it is. Okay, so then now, I'm going to move the box to the point of attachment. Can you see that the error is going to zero? <coughs> the error is going to zero and now it's so small that it can't be seen anymore. Okay, so then now, if the error, this, this epsilon term doesn't go to zero, then the function isn't differentiable there. What that's saying is that, well, either from one side or the other, the error term is not going away. So then if you can't approximate the graph with a straight line, it's not differentiable there. It's not. Okay, so now we need the exact same thing in calculus 2, except now we don't have tangent lines anymore. We're going to have tangent what? Tangent planes, right? Tangent planes, because what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, in a sense, there's a tangent line. If I choose a surface and I move only in one direction, then I can attach a tangent line in that direction. But then if I choose the orthogonal direction, the other coordinate direction, then I can attach another tangent line. I can attach another tangent line. And in a sense, what we're hoping is that there's a plane, a plane which contains both of those tangent lines. A plane which contains both of those tangent lines and the error of approximation is going to go to zero as the changes in each coordinate direction also go to zero. So what we're saying is that we hope that Given a surface, you can attach a tangent plane and you can get close enough to the point of attachment that the actual surface and the tangent plane are indistinguishable. Right? So you're accustomed to this, right? If you look at a picture of the Earth, right? The Earth is not a is not the surface of the Earth is not actually continuous by most arguments, right? So then you fall off a waterfall, that's you know that's not continuous, right? <laughs> not a continuous change. <coughs> okay, but you get so far away from the Earth, right, you can't even see the mountains. Right? The Earth is quite smooth. So then you can see that, ah, if there is a smooth surface, there should be a tangent plane. Right? It's just like being a human, right? To me, walking outside, the Earth looks flat. Okay? Because the Earth is so big in comparison to me. You know, if I delete the buildings and things like this. Okay. So then now we have the calculus 2 definition. So now we are given z is f of x and y. z is f of x and y. And we're also going to be given delta x and delta y. And this is how far, this is how far we're going to travel in each one of the coordinate directions. <coughs> okay, and some point, we also need some point x0, y0 in the domain of f of x and y. So, <coughs> we're going to define delta z is equal to f of x plus delta x, y plus delta y, minus f of x and y. Okay, <coughs> that is to say that we've somehow selected some point 
x, y, and what, and someone has said, I want you to move delta x in the x coordinate direction and delta y in the y coordinate direction. I want you to move there, and I want you to measure the vertical dif distance uh, of the height change, right? How far did you go up or down? Okay, so then that's what delta z is. <coughs> now, if, if delta z can be written as delta z is equal to f sub x xy delta x plus f sub y xy delta y delta y plus some error term in the x direction plus some other error term in the y direction. So if z can be written as follows <coughs> and delta w uh, epsilon 1 goes to 0 and epsilon 2 goes to 0 as delta x delta y goes to zero, then, <coughs> then, F is differentiable at XY. Okay, now what is this saying? This is saying that delta Z, we're saying is FX delta x plus fy delta y. So what that's saying is that you've measured fx, that's the slope in the x direction. And you've measured fy, that's the slope in the y direction. So this, this thing that I am uh, marking in red, this is the linear part. It's the part that looks like a plane. Okay, this other part, <coughs> this is the error. The error in treating the surface where you are as a plane. So what it's saying is this, is if you, if you can find a plane and attach it at that point and then compute the error from any direction, and if the error goes to zero as you go to the point of attachment, then a tangent plane uh, then the function is differentiable there because to as good of approximation as you wish, the function can be treated as a plane okay. for, all it, for, <coughs> for your purpose, right? You can make the error as small as you wish. Okay, now this is a pretty complicated thing, but now I'd like to point out, I'd like to point out something, and that is, it is perfectly possible for me to give you a function that has an x partial and a y partial but is not differentiable. Right, it can have an x partial and also a y partial and not be differentiable. The vast, vast majority of the functions that you will ever see in your life, including this class, are differentiable. Okay, but I can give you a function that has an x partial and also a y partial that's not differentiable. So, here is the, here is the uh, requirement here. It is this. <coughs> so, given f of x and y and some point x0, y0, okay, if 1, fx is continuous in an open disk containing x0, y0 and to fy is continuous in the same. So that is to say that I give you a point and a function and you can comp compute both of the first partials and both of the first partials are continuous in an open disk containing the point in question, then what is the conclusion? 
f is differentiable at x0, y0. So how do, I, how do I make a question that comes out of this? It is this. I construct some function very carefully, okay, usually a piecewise defined function, so that <coughs> its x partial or its y partial or both <coughs> are not continuous at a point. I can make them defined. It's no problem to make them defined. But I can make them not continuous. And if they're not continuous, either one of them not continuous, <coughs> then it doesn't, the plane, <coughs> the function is not differentiable. Okay, good. So any question concerning this? Finally, the important part, at least important to me, right? So these things are important for you to know, you know, as far as the math police are concerned and the legal, legal things, right? You've got to know this definition. Now, I would say just as important is the geometry of what's happening. Okay, so in calculus one, <coughs> in calculus one, you have the following picture. And it is a very simple picture in retrospect. <laughs> Okay, so then there's a function. There's a point where I'm going to do a tangent attachment. Okay. So then from this, from this point x, I'll go over. Uh, a quantity delta x. I'll make that delta x. The vertical change is denoted delta y. Okay, so then this change right here is delta y. So that's the change that it actually makes. Okay, now the tangent line, the tangent, doesn't go up the same amount delta y. It goes up another quantity. And what is the name for that quantity? The name for that quantity is not delta y, but by. Okay, and this, right, this term is also called dx. So then... <coughs> The picture in calculus one is the following. It is that dy is f prime evaluated at x dx. It is to say, if you're at the point of attachment and you want to know how far you go up, well, the name for that is dy, and you take the derivative and you multiply it by how far you go to the right, right, using a triangle. So here's the picture in calculus one. The picture in calculus two is more involved because there's now two directions. Okay, so let's draw it. Okay, so then this drawing starts out with a box. And you just have to forgive my drawing skills here. Okay, so I'm drawing a box. Okay, not really, right? Let's do this one. Yeah. Okay, that's a pretty good box. Okay, so then <coughs> now, what we're going to say is that this point right here, this is the point on the xy plane, this is a point that we're selecting xy. Point that we're selecting xy. So then now, we're going to assume that we have zoomed in so far to this, that this function is differentiable and that we have zoomed in so far, an infinite amount of zoom, so that it is now no longer possible to tell the difference between this function and its tangent plane. That's how far we've zoomed in. Okay, so then this distance right here is dx, right, this distance. Okay, and this other distance is what? dy. 
So you've got to remember where these go. I know that some of you are thinking, wait a minute, doesn't, aren't those in the wrong position? And the answer is no, because remember this has to be a right-handed coordinate system. Okay? And making this distance, the distance in and out of the page, makes it right-handed if z is up. Yes? We're, we're, I agree, it's a very important question, and we're, do, we're getting to it just now. Okay, and the answer is these are supposed to be dy and dx, <coughs> and we'll see just exactly why. Okay, so then now, let's say that in the x direction, in the x direction, you measure a change that looks like so. Okay, so that it looks like that in the x direction. Okay, and let's say in the y direction, in the y, no, I should make that red, shouldn't I? Yeah, I'll make it red since I made that other stuff red. Okay, and in the y direction, you measure some other change like so. So you can see it changes somewhat in the x direction and another amount in the y direction. Now, since this is a tangent plane, it has to change exactly the same amount, uh, the ex exactly the same amount in this direction. So then now, I'll draw this horizontal, so it's not changing from there in that direction. So here I'll make this red. Okay, now from here, from here, <coughs> this one also doesn't change at all. Okay, that one doesn't change at all. <coughs> But from here now, so I'll make this one that color. From here now, I'll say that from this corner, from this corner, now I need to move up, move up further so it will look like this. Okay, and from the other corner, I need to move up uh, two units, and so it will look like this. Okay. So we sort of have this weird picture where we go up, at least on my drawing, right? We went over this far, we went up two units where the units are the lines in my notebook looking paper. And in this direction, we went up sort of one unit where the lines are, the unit is the lines in my notebook paper. So altogether, how far did we go up right here? Three units, right? Three units. So then now, this measurement right here, this measurement right here, and I know you're antsy to go and we're, we're almost finished. This is dz. That's dz. So then that is to say that now we have dx goes that far, dy goes that far, and dz is the measurement from this corner to the far corner. How far does it go up? Now, to relate this, to relate this, we have the following, and that is, okay, here we have another similar triangle. Right, this distance is not dz, it's the one you were wondering about, it is the script dz, right? This one, dz. Okay, and what is this one? This is not dy, this is what? Script dy. Ah, <laughs> the plot thickens, right? Okay, so then now this one, this one right here, this measurement, this is another copy of dz, right? Not necessarily to scale. You can't see it anymore? Let me, maybe I'll move it like this. Is it better? Okay, so then this other measurement right here will be what? dx. So now what we need is we need to relate. Okay. Here is this front triangle right here. We have two similar triangles, a larger triangle and an interior triangle. So can you see that this smaller one is similar to the bigger one? So the question is, the question is, is what, what is this measurement right here? And the answer, so I won't hold you in suspense any longer, if you use a similar triangle argument is dz dy multiplied by dy. Right, that's the height of this, this piece of the triangle. Okay, so if that's the height of that piece of the triangle, then what is the height of this piece of the triangle? It's dz dx dx. So then, 
So then, it should not matter, and it does not matter which order you do this in, right? If you first travel in the x direction and then the y direction, then you will travel up this far and then that far. So then, you could do it in the other order. So what is dz? DZ, so I'll do it in alphabetical order. dz dx dx plus, plus dz dy dy. So this thing right here is called the total differential. And we will talk more about it on Thursday. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand your question. <laughs>